Thank you. Can, can I say your pronunciation was excellent? Um, it's Aradeg Medaliar, and I'll explain to that to you a bit later on. Uh, you'll forgive me if my uh, remarks to you this morning are a bit less practical, uh, less trade oriented, and more theoretical, if you like, and it's specifically about language. Um, the reason I, talk, I want to talk about language is because it's my academic subject. I think it is actually quite fundamental to relationships between groups. Uh, there we are, language issues between groups, problems, and opportunities. And if I look around the room here, I, I guess we have 15, 20, 30 languages, of which I contribute two. I speak Welsh and I speak English. In fact, I speak Welsh and then I speak English. This is my second language. As we all, many of us say in Wales, I, I couldn't speak English until I was about seven, and I've, I've been practicing ever since, as it were. Um, but my, my contribution will be a bit more theoretical, and it's about um, respecting language. It's about respecting people's cultural identity when you have intergroup relations, whether it is about trade, about Hitchcock groups wandering around London, or it's, a, it's about uh, conflict resolution in the Balkans, which is something I'm going to talk briefly about in a moment. But it's, it's more about the, the, the theoretical place of language. And I did have a quick look uh, the other day on, at this, which is the Commonwealth Charter, um, uh, because Mark ref referred to it specifically when we were talking. So I had a quick look through it, and uh, it is um, point four. And I'll just, just, I won't read it all, but what it does say is, as part of the Commonwealth Charter, it says, we emphasize the need to promote tolerance, respect, understanding, moderation, and religious freedom, etc. Now, for me, what that means is that uh, we uh, not only tolerate, but celebrate diversity in international groups. And uh, that's, that's by implication must mean that we celebrate and enable um, the, the variety of languages that we have in this room and in any other international gathering. Um, I sometimes attend meetings of the Celtic group of nations, that is Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Brittany, Cornwall, and sometimes Galicia in northern, northern Spain. It is a paradox, I think, that when we have those sorts of meetings, uh, we all speak in English, which is peculiar given that you know, our reason for being is to promote these so-called minority languages. By the way, Welsh is not my minority language, it's my majority language at, at an individual level. But, let that be. So, um, firstly, to think of the, this topic as uh, of cultural diplomacy. Some people see it in, in very practical terms. We just heard a little bit now about taking high culture out to, to other countries and the role of the British Council. Um, is that cultural uh, 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 diplomacy? It's using culture to facilitate relations between, between groups. Um, as a sociologist of some sort, I, I think I have a, a, a different conception of culture. Um, I'm not talking about just taking Shakespeare out to, to rural villages, or for that matter, to uh, little towns in Wales. Um, culture, by the way, as a word in English, is, 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 is quite interesting, I think. It, it comes from the concept of agriculture, of, of taking the raw, taking the wild, and taming it, as it were. You know, that's, uh, the, the idea is of culture is that he goes out there and pulls it all in. Uh, there's, a, there's an English poet called Spencer writing in the late Middle Ages, and uh, he, he talks about the pale in Ireland, the, the part settled by, essentially by the British or the English, and they put a big fence around it called the pale, and people living outside the pale were beyond the pale. Some of you might have heard that phrase before. Um, literally beyond the pale, that is, they were uncultured, they were outside. My view of culture is rather different. It's, uh, as, as somebody who speaks Welsh, I, I, I call it diwylliant. And it's more about uh, associations of inclusivity, of shared identity. My culture tells me who I am. It's not that I read Shakespeare, though I do. And it's not because I watch French films in the French and with my dictionary, which I also do. But it's something about group identity. And if there's group identity in, in a multicultural situation, there's also a need for respect and for uh, a recognition of people's own identity. Now, all of these arguments for me arise out of my own experience of using the Welsh language. 
next door to probably the most successful language in the world, that is English, or to be perfectly precise, American English. Um, so here we have a, a, a nation of three million people in the west of, of these islands and uh, speaking a language which has existed since at least the fifth century. And we're still talking it next door to this uh, extremely successful and uh, quite frankly aggressive language. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a, a, a um, proverb in, 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 uh, in Mandarin, I think it is. Um, if you share a cage with a tiger, you learn to walk softly. And uh, I think that's what we have done over the years. And we're still there. But that gives me a certain experience of the importance of language in intergroup relations. I hope that you'll find this interesting because it ain't about selling <coughs> aircraft parts to Nigeria or whatever it is. It's about something rather more, rather more fundamental. Sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be rude. Um, I'm not being rude, actually. Okay, so language as language is often little regarded in intergroup relations. What we often have, uh, especially in terms of colonial powers and former colonial uh, former colonies, is a, a great care to uh, in you know to respect the uh, the integrity of the former colonies to have documents such as the Commonwealth Charter, which sets out in very fine terms how we should interact with each other, and a great care to um, avoid perhaps some of the vocabulary that was previously associated with colonialism. So we, we, uh, we uh, look at the language and we take some terms and never use them. You know, they, they are in the not-to-be-used box. However, meetings on the whole often are in just one language. The language as language is not a, not a, not a particular issue. I know in international conferences, of course, they have simultaneous translation. That's something I'm going to go on to in a moment. By the way, in this place, which is the Parliament of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, if I were to Dechra Sharad and Gebraig to start speaking in Welsh, I'd be chucked out. And uh, they say that every good politician should be thrown out of the legislature at least once. You know, it's, a, it's a badge of honour. And uh, it has often occurred to me that I should up and stand up and speak Welsh just in order to be chucked out and watch this space on that one. I, 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 quite, I might do so. Um, by the way, you can also speak Norman French, uh, um, but it's very, very seldom used, and it's uh, just for ceremonial purposes. But a language which is used as a day-to-day -day language by at least 600,000 people in Wales is not allowed. Or if I, if, I, um, if I use it, I have to follow it up with an instantaneous translation. Um, I get around this occasionally. For example, in debates on the, on the postal service, by saying things like, um, if a letter goes from Rhoslan i'r Chrigog to Sarn Melltyrn via Llan Fer Pwllgyn i'r Chrigog Erwch Mwyndrobwyl Llan Tysilio Gog Goch, will it be lost in the post? And uh, the people who take the notes say, <laughs> <laughs> send us all the place names immediately, because uh, I use the place names. But um, anyway, th 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 that's, that's by, by the by. Language use in politics, of course, is hugely significant, and hugely significant in, in diplomacy. Um, and this is particularly so, I think, as com communication has become more instantaneous. Um, you know, <laughs> people from one end of the globe talk to the people from the other end as if they were next door. It's, I mean, I, I, I'm extremely elderly by now, I suppose, and I'm continually astonished to see people talking through Skype, perhaps, with people in Australia, New Zealand, or South Africa, wherever it is. Um, and as that develops, I think the, the need to be more language aware and have a language etiquette becomes even more apparent. Right, well, it seems to me that using language as a tool in the political discourse between groups, therefore, is, is a great opportunity. You know? If we recognise that language is an issue and it's just not the words, don't use particular words. If, it's, if there's a question around language, it's a, it's a huge... Um, uh, it's a huge opportunity. It's also, uh, you're familiar with the term um, uh, asymmetric, you know, that uh, some powers have a huge amount of power, some say the United States have lots of uh, nuclear weapons and uh, their opponents, their enemies might have uh, very simple arms, but they're, they're unfortunately able to, to attack civilians in the dreadful way that they have. It's an asymmetric situation. You might be armed to the teeth, but vulnerable. And I think, 
with language. There's some things, it's not a conflict, but there's something similar going on. When I make a speech in Welsh, I'm always careful to say a few words in English for the camera. Yeah? Um, I think it was a, a Zimbabwean politician I saw doing this on television first. Uh, he was a man called Joshua Nkomo. Some people will, will remember him. He was a great figure in the independence struggle in, in Zimbabwe. It was sometime in the early 80s, and he was talking, I think, in Shona. I'm not sure. I think he was talking in Shona. And then suddenly, he switched to English, and it was clearly for the cameras. I mean, it, it was the asymmetric use of language. And it's... Uh, it's the people who don't speak the main language actually being cleverer players at the language game. I think that's what's happening uh, really there. Because the impression is often given to, to Westerners or uh, specifically to Anglo-Americans that they all speak English anyway, when clearly we don't. That, that's, that's the impression at least. And you know, that's quite useful really. If, if, if I want to get a message across in one of my speeches, I phrase the message very carefully in English, and that's what they get. And they can't get the other stuff on either side because it's in Welsh. Um, so an asymmetric use of language by a politician there. And um, the rest of the time, I use my own language in a respectful way to, to my audience. Um, indeed, as I said, the Commonwealth Charter itself talks about tolerance and respect and understanding, which are, is how I interpret this particular question. Um, I know I'm talking too much already, but, uh, and you, you want your coffee, but perhaps I can explain just a little bit about the background of my own linguistic group. Um, might, might be interesting. I said that um, Welsh as language has existed since about the 5th century. Um, the Welsh polity, the Welsh government, as, as was, not very well organised, but existed until 1282, so we have seven or eight hundred years of independence, and the Welsh language is the language of government. Uh, the laws are codified in the 9th, 10th century uh, by someone called Hoel Da. I mean, I'm Hoel. He was King Hoel Da, Hoel the Good, and he codified the laws. And they were in Welsh. But interestingly, for the women amongst us, uh, uh, women in Welsh law have a legal personality, by the way, and can own property, um, etc. Um, Welsh law was supplanted in 1536 when Wales became part of England. And um, that's the 1536 Act of Union, uh, which essentially, to put it in a nutshell, uh, there was a, 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 an infamous uh, entry in the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica in the 19th century. And when he looked up in the index and he looked for Wales, he said, see England. <laughs> <Yeah>? <laughs> so Wales, see England. There are more interesting things, actually, when you look at England, there's nothing there about Wales. <laughs> That's even more interesting, I think. But 1536 uh, said, well, Wales is that western part of the British Isles, formerly known as Wales, now part of, of England. And it specifically said that its aim was to extirpate the Welsh language. It said that no one who uh, uses a Welsh speech or language shall have or enjoy any manner of office or fees in the king's realm. If you wanted a job with the king, you couldn't speak Welsh. Didn't say you couldn't speak Welsh you know, when you were buying a loaf of bread, but if you wanted to get on in the world, and some of you from former colonies will be familiar with this, if you want to get on in the world, you have to, have to speak English. And essentially, that was it. When we had various uh, uprisings in Wales in the Middle Ages, the most famous one being Owen Glyndwr's uprising in 1400, when we had these uprisings, one of the demands always was that Welsh would be an official language. Um, Owen Glyndwr's policy, by the way, was threefold. To establish an university in the south and the north of the country. To have direct relations between the church in Wales and Rome without having to go through, through, through London. And that Welsh should be the, the language of government. That's, that's uh, about 600 years ago. And we're still sort of working quite hard on it. Um, so you have 1536. Wales ceases to be, in some ways, as, a, as a, an independence policy. In 1942, there's the Welsh Courts Act. I've had a lot of campaigning where you can use Welsh in the courts. 67, 1967, I've had a lot more campaigning, uh, the Welsh Language Act, which said that um, Welsh and English should be treated on the basis of equality. Now, that's worded very, very carefully. On the basis of equality, not equality. Um, that um, if a text was in Welsh, it would be counted as if it is in English. 
know, it's like honorary membership of English for Welsh. But it does say significantly, if there's a divergence between the two texts, the English shall stand. So if it says in Welsh, die, uh, die in Bedwar, and it says in English, two and two is five, I'm afraid it's five and not four. Yeah. You take it to the, to the extremes. Um, we've had further language legislation in 93 and again in 2011. So there we are. W what that illustrates, I think, is long-term relations between two cultural groups, between two nations, between, between two political groups, if you like. And that language is a central issue throughout the time that that relationship has been, has been extant. Interestingly, you know, that because until this last century, most Welsh speakers were monoglots, we didn't speak English. We didn't actually speak English. In order practically to run the state, you had to use the local language. And I think that might be the case in African countries and elsewhere within the Commonwealth. Whatever officially they say about English being the language of the state, if you want to get things done, you have to use the, yeah, and that's how it was in Wales. Um, we are now almost exclusively bilingual. Nearly everybody in Wales speaks English as well as Welsh. What's interesting for us as a multicultural, multilinguistic group, what's interesting is that people choose to speak Welsh. It's not that they choose to speak English, the peculiarity or the wonderful. I, I think it's a miraculous thing that people speak Welsh. Uh, I have with me in, in the corner there uh, a school student from, from my constituency uh, whose uh, first language is Welsh, isn't it? And uh, would find it virtually impossible to speak English with me face to face. And she can object if she likes. But, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't appeal to the gallery, should I? But um, you know, the, the, the miracle is that that's how it is. So, what implication does this have um, for cultural diplomacy and cultural diplomacy in the widest sense, not in the sense of sending Shakespeare out to to small villages? What implications does that have? I'll give you some, some practical examples which I've been involved in since I've been an MP. And the first one is uh, a, 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 an interesting, rather frightening case I was involved in, in about a Balkan country about five years ago. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, this Balkan country had a majority language group and a minority language group, and they were in conflict. In fact, they had been shooting at each other. And for various complicated political reasons, <coughs> the minority group walked out and went up into the hills where they had been before with their guns. And it looked as if there might be a shooting war again. As a very, as a tiny part of the diplomatic effort, very tiny part uh, of the diplomatic effort, I went up there to see the, the chief guy of, of the, the minority language group. Um, it's the very first time I've ever met, and the only time I hope I've met uh, an indicted war criminal. But there we are, up in the hills in this Balkan country. And I went there specifically to invite him to come to Wales to see a democratic institution, that is the Welsh Assembly, working bilingually with simultaneous translation and with documentation in two languages and respect and all that sort of thing. Yeah? This was part, a very small part of the diplomatic efforts. Um, and after <laughs> doing lots of fa fairly hair-raising things up in the hills for three days, um, I went back to, to London and a few weeks later, they turned up and they had various meetings here. They went down to Cardiff. They saw the Welsh language television channel working. They saw the Welsh language board and they went down to our assembly and saw a democratic institution working bilingually and off they went back to their country. And a few months later, perhaps, perhaps influenced slightly by this experience, they went back into parliament and started demanding language rights and, and uh, democratic rights and respect and all that sort of stuff. So here you have a very small example of a proper recognition of what cultural diplomacy might be actually affecting real politics. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. A rather more light example. I, I was over in Brussels a few years ago uh, at a, a conference about language within government. And uh, we were there to, uh, to uh, lightly grill the commissioner on language and also the uh, commissioner on Commissioner on Electronic Developments, on, on uh, IT. And uh, language is not an interesting subject for people here. So I turned up, and there was a desk, and there were six chairs, and they said, the United Kingdom at the front. And I sat down, and it was me. It was, I was it. It was astonishing. I had put the headphones on and uh, spoke, for, spoke for the country, as it were. Um, and had my opportunity to ask these commissioners about various questions. What was interesting for me, however, next door to me was Poland. 
and there was a, an extremely distinguished gentleman there uh, with whiskers and uh, a very fine cut suit. And uh, he said, uh, the language of diplomacy in pre-war Poland was French. I will speak French and then pre presented the Polish position in French. Now, symbolically, that was hugely interesting to me. I mean, he was, he was, uh, he was claiming legitimacy by appealing to a pre-communist era and doing it in this fantastically elegant sort of way by speaking diplomatic French. I thought that was wonderful. But it does, it's just a small example to you of how an awareness of culture and language can be fairly central to, to the presentation of the dip diplomatic position. And the third question, the third example I wanted to give you very quickly is uh, one which is, is a running tour in Turkey for the last how many years since, since, uh, since the Turkish uh, government was established after the end of the Ottoman Empire, and that is the situation of the Kurdish people, of which there are 29 million, and the language is banned, or has been banned at least, and the cause of the dreadful conflict in Eastern Anatolia, one of the main causes has been the language issue. Um, it's because they, they say, well, they, they don't, the Turkish government doesn't recognize our language, can't teach it in the schools, can't use it publicly, uh, we're not allowed to have it on television, etc. And that's one of the causes. There are other causes, but that's one of the causes of a very fierce shooting war there, uh, which has been going on for, I don't know, 25 years, I think. At the last count, I think about 30,000 people have been killed. And if there was anything that we could do to use um, a proper recognition of the value of language in relations between groups, if we could anything we could do to, to influence that position, uh, you know, th it would be a, a huge step forward. I've been to, to the Kurdish area of Turkey a number of times and have met various people and have done my little bits and uh, recently met somebody from the foreign office and said, well, do you think there's anything that we could do in terms of, of cultural linguistic diplomacy to, to, to try to resolve this? And to be quite frank, you know, if my experiences in a Balkan country were tiny, as compared to the Kurdish problem, they, the, uh, that's even tinier. I mean, it's, a, it's an electron of one atom from an elephant, basically. But I'm sure that something could be done to help people on both sides to see how they could resolve the language question, at least. And that might be a step to not shooting at each other. Sorry if I'm being a little bit flippant, because it is a, an extremely uh, heartbreaking and serious situation there. I'm glad to say it looks as if they're, they're moving very gradually um, towards some sort of resolution. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see about that. But I thought those three examples of Kurdistan, as they call it, of the, the Polish gentleman speaking French, and also my experiences in the Balkans, shows you that, you know, that language actually can be not just a problem, but a tool, an opportunity as well as a problem. Um, I've spoken quite enough as it is, but I will um, just explain the title of this lecture, which you pronounced wonderfully, Aradeg Medaliar, and this is a Welsh proverb. It means if you're going to catch hens, go slowly. Yeah. If you rush at them, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. catch hens, be sneaky, Aradeg Medaliar. And I think that is the proverb that most properly applies to this, to this particular issue. Um, I always say in this place, you know, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's something that you take carefully, having thought about it very carefully beforehand, which is why I say Aradeg um, Metaliar. I'll just end, end with a, a little joke, if I can find it. Um, a couple of things, something that's worth practically considering, and the business people amongst you might, might want to take this up. If we are going to facilitate the use of more than one language at a very local level, I think simultaneous translation is the way to do that. That's what we use all the time. I have meetings locally around a table of that size, and I speak in one language, and the person facing me speaks in the other, though he knows that I can speak his language. But as, as, a, as a kindness, I, I provide simultaneous translations so that he's not left out, sort of thing. Yeah? How do we provide that more effectively? I, I, I had this idea, or even a vision, some time ago. You know, that's, uh, you can communicate with people in the most rural parts of Africa by phone now because of satellite technology. There's also something called Bluetooth, which is 
very short range radio transmission. If you put those two together and have, say, in, in a central place, a bunch of interpreters who can use lots of different languages, they use satellite phones to get to the very local meeting and they have their little headphones. You can then provide simultaneous translation hundreds of miles away from a bunch of experts. And all you need to do is send the headsets out and have an etiquette as to how you use them. And in that way, we'd facilitate um, making bilingualism or multilingualism uh, a commonality, uh, a commonplace, something unremarkable. And given that the number of languages in the world is declining, I think that, that's something that is, you know, it's, it's a noble ambition. I, I don't know who'd do this. Uh, I mean, probably the UN or somebody. But, you know, it's, it's an idea, at least. Um, I, I call it the Babel fish idea. Does, do people know about the Babel fish? Some people will. It's, it's an idea from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, a science fiction comedy book. Um, and uh, Douglas Adams, who wrote it, uh, came up with this idea of the Babel fish. And uh, it's, it's all set in outer space. And he says of the Babel fish, the Babel fish is a small yellow leech-like creature and is probably the oddest thing in, in the universe. It feeds on brain wave energy from those around it and then excretes into the mind of its carrier a telepathic matrix picked up from the speech centers of the brains around him. The practical upshot of all of this is that if you stick a babel fish in your ear, you can instantly understand anything said to you in any form of language. <laughs> Isn't that a fabulous idea that you have a, a creature which will do this sort of uh, telepathic uh, translation for you. Disappointingly, I'm afraid, if you read on, Adams said, says in his book, um, the poor Babel fish, by effectively removing all barriers to communication between different races and cultures, has caused more and bloodier wars than anything in the history of creation. <laughs> so I, th I think that's a bit sort of pessimistic um, because I tend to think that improving communication is, is, all, is all good, I think. You know? um, I'm sorry if this has been not very practical. I've given some practical examples, but I, I hope it's been sort of fairly stimulating and I'd be very glad to, to take questions or if you want to break for coffee, uh, I will escape and do something else. Okay, thank you.